And we'll record it to your PC. It's going to record to PC. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Thank you. You're a lifesaver. Okay. Okay, guys. We're ready. All technology. Hey, Pamela. Hi. I'm getting my students out here. They're coming. <laughs> okay. Could you just show me how to share um, images in the video? Look at the bottom, and you see share screen. Yes. You just take the screen, and then you put um, then it's yours. Okay. So I'm gonna whatever's on my screen, they're gonna see. Yes. Yep. So do oh, that. Okay. Now. Take Figure it out yet? Uh, almost. <laughs> okay. Um, it tells me I need to uh, quit Zoom to be able to. Yeah, the screen now. Record the screen. No, just go to share screen. And it should just, we should share. Okay, so I'm going to share my desktop. Yes. I have to go into privacy and grant access. Okay, I don't know how your computer is set up. When you share screen, you just press share screen. So I think I need to quit Zoom and then come back in. That's what it's telling me. So let me try that, okay? Yes, go ahead. Okay, did the screen share? <laughs> yes, yes, perfect, thank you. It did, okay. Can you minimize that thing, it's the white, it's on your side, okay. Okay, you can let me know when you're ready. Oh, it's so nice to see everyone. <laughs> so welcome to our talk. Thank you for coming today. And thank you to Pamela for hosting my exhibition. Um, I really appreciate it. And um, I know how hard it is to hang a show and I'm really glad you um, did such a beautiful job at it. I could see some of the images in the back there. So this exhibition is called Floating Blue. And this originated over the years between 2009 and 2017. And um, I started going to Greenland in 2009 and it took about six or seven years to put together enough images to have this entire exhibition. And before the exhibition came out, um, I was searching around online one day and I found some really beautiful work by an artist I really enjoyed. 
And as soon as I saw her work, I thought, wow, that is so beautiful. I would love to go and see that. Where can I see that work? And when I started researching, I found out that her work had only been exhibited once. And then it went into a gallery collection. And the only way to see it was to purchase her very expensive prints. And I thought, now that's what I don't want my work to do. I want my work to be out there. I want people to be able to see it and I want it to be available. So what I decided I was gonna do with this exhibition was that I was going to send it out and try to never have it come back to me. So it would just go from venue to venue to venue. So it's been touring since 2017. It opened in Beijing, China. And so far it's been to 16 venues in the US. And I believe what is in your gallery there is about 20 of the 30 images from the Floating Blue exhibition. So I call myself a multimedia visual and performance artist. And here's a little bit about how that came about. I studied painting and photography and also modern dance when I was in college. And I got fascinated by the element of time and started telling stories. And when I started telling stories, um, I had just finished college and went into graduate school to develop how to tell stories and put them together in works of art. So a, a work of art would be the mode through which the story would be told. I moved to New York City in the mid nineties and I started teaching yoga as spiritual practice in New York City. And about 10 years later, I started traveling. And when I started traveling, I went to really far off remote places like the Faroe Islands and the North Atlantic, Greenland, Iceland, Norway, India. And I started putting little photographs that I made with a pocket camera on my yoga website. And my students started saying to me, wow, those photographs are really beautiful. You should have an exhibition and put them together. So I put together all the photographs and then I wrote seven short stories. And I used the stories as a linking mechanism to tie everything together in the exhibition. So the exhibition was called The End of Nowhere, Stories and Photographs. This image right here is actually the last image in the exhibition. It's a photograph of me with my bicycle. I traveled down the bicycle when I went to these remote places. I'd have all my gear hanging on this rack on the back here. And this is a little tent that I carried and slept in every night. And <clears throat> the stories are about the encounters and the miracles and some of the unusual things that happened along the way. I'll read to you the first little story from the End of Nowhere exhibition. It's about a two minute read. I take up three seats with my bike and all my gear on the A train. It's a long ride from my tiny apartment in lower Manhattan to Kennedy Airport. I can't quite grasp the enormity of having an entire month to spend wandering through the raw and wild wilderness of a few far off countries but it has me smiling from ear to ear. I already know the exact spot where I will sleep on the ground my first night. The journey begins where I left off last year. I'll take naps in the grass, bathe in the rivers, cook over a little stove and eat the same simple foods every day. I'll sit mesmerized for hours watching icebergs and listening to the eerie sounds they make when they turn over or crash into pieces. It's always disorienting after a few weeks go by and I can't remember what day it is. Then I'll have a good laugh when I realize I don't even need to know. I always notice the moment the fences along the road end. It signals that I've arrived at the edge of nowhere and all the rules are about to change. 
the spaciousness becomes infinite and the land belongs to me. The last few days it felt like I've bilocated, as if part of me is already there and the rest is just waiting to catch up. I remember a passage I once read at a chai shop high in the Himalayas of India. There was a journal on the table in which travelers had written stories and drawn pictures. While sipping tea and swatting flies, I opened the book to a random page. It read, very important meetings arranged by the soul long before the bodies ever see each other. This is an install image of that exhibition. This is at the cultural center of Cape Cod. Their Great Hall is a very beautiful space. It used to be an old bank. So this is a bank vault door here. These doorways are actually other galleries. They used to be offices off of the main banking area. This is an image of how the stories were integrated with the visual images. So the stories are printed on foam core and every five or six images, you'd stop and read one of the little stories. And here's some close-ups of the images. This is one of everyone's favorite. This is a llama skeleton in Patagonia, South America. I don't think anybody would have ever seen this if they hadn't been on a bicycle. The road is back here near my cursor and I was going slow enough that I could look over and, and see these ribs going up into the sky a little bit. And what I love about the photograph is it's taken from eye level. So the camera is down on the ground and it's almost as if you're looking right into the eye of the llama and the llama is looking back at you. This is an image of the vanishing road in Norway way up high on a mountain top with the eerie feel of no one else there, abandonment. It's dark, cold, foggy. And here's some of the iceberg images. I like photographing icebergs with no references to land, people, or other boats. I just like the wildness and the bizarreness of the iceberg all by itself. So this is like a vertical wall of ice. It could be a little bit hard to try to decipher scale in some of the iceberg images. Most icebergs in these photographs are between 50 and 100 feet tall. This is on the Disco Island on the west coast of Greenland. This is an image of a fish drying rack. And here it looks like the iceberg is passing, but icebergs near the shore are actually lodged to the bottom of the ocean. So they're stuck there. So this iceberg was actually there the whole three days I was on the little island. It never moved. And this is an ice fjord. So here it's like iceberg gridlock where there's many icebergs all compressed together. This is another vertical wall. I like how this almost looks like plastic. This is a close up of some of the ice piled up in the fjord. There's different types of ice here. This sharp type of ice is ice that's been underwater recently. So this would be an iceberg that's just turned over. 
And then in the foreground, this smooth ice, this would be ice that's been in the sun for a while. So it was smooth because it was melting in the sun. This is one of my all-time favorite images. I only went to the east coast of, coast of Greenland once. And this is near a beach. And I camped near the beach. And in the morning, I got out of my little tent and I went for a walk. And I ran into this ice sculpture. And to me, it just looks so magnificently perfect with such beautiful contours. It's about three feet high and six feet wide. So it's actually quite tiny. And I guess that it had come in with a tide and then the water just left it there on the beach. I was really glad I got to enjoy it because I guess that by the end of the day, the sun probably would have melted it. So now we'll go back to Floating Blue, which is the exhibition in your gallery there. Here's another good example of smooth ice that's been on the, in the sun for a while. And then over here is sharp ice. So this iceberg was upside down recently and it had just completely turned over. So I'll tell you a little bit about the ice. In the fjord, it's very stationary. The ice doesn't move very much. Um, but you see here in the foreground how there's all these shards of ice. This usually indicates that an iceberg has dislodged and moved out to sea. It doesn't happen very often. It takes about a year for the icebergs to break off the glacier, move through the fjord and then make their way out to the sea. But this little trail of debris usually indicates that within the last day or so, a large iceberg is dislodged, dislodged and made its way out to sea. I try to photograph the icebergs in the evening when they take on a blue tone, because during the day, the sun is so bright in Greenland that the ice just appears burnt or washed out. So icebergs just look white and don't have a lot of color or excitement to them during the day. Um, one night I was, I was in Greenland and we had a really heavy rainstorm all through the night. And I hadn't seen the icebergs yet. It was my first day there. And I kept hearing a crashing sound that sounded like thunder, but without the reverberation, just doosh, 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 all through the night. And it was the strangest sound. I couldn't quite figure out what it was. And when I woke up in the morning, I realized it could only be the ice cracking. So as the rain hit the ice and the rain was warmer than the ice, the ice was cracking all through the night. And the fjord here, it's a amazing ecosystem. There's all kinds of wildlife. There's many, many species of birds that are moving about on the ice and uh, living on the ice. There's whales and seals that live in the fjord because it's so rich with minerals and oxygen. And I really love the fog. Usually in the evening, if I'm lucky, there'll be some nice fog because the ice is giving off um, such a cool temperature and it's clashing a little bit with the atmosphere. And when the icebergs do cave, when they crash, they create enormous waves that come up onto the beach. So there's some signage near the beach warning people not to camp on the beach because they could be killed by the tsunamis. And a couple more images from the floating blue exhibition. This image, as well as the last one, were both taken from the land. So I'm standing on a hillside. The terrain there is very steep. Um, it's very difficult to walk. 
It's a bit like San Francisco. If you've ever been there, by the end of the day, your calves and shins really hurt from going up and down so many hills. And the terrain is also very marsh-like. It, it feels like a the plants feel like a rubbery succulent type of substance underneath your feet. This was a favorite iceberg because it was right outside my tent the first time I went to Greenland. It changed a lot from the time I arrived. All these cuts along the side kept falling apart and caving. This one always reminded me a little bit of a, a camel's hump. I love the color too. It's like a nice blue green. This was one particularly good evening for shooting. The sky was doing all kinds of wonderful things. And it was an interesting blue tone to the ice. I think you could tell from the sky that these are all on the same evening. I like sometimes to get an image where there's no water in it, like this one, where it looks more like a moonscape. This one, I know this one's not in your gallery. A few of them didn't make it to your gallery because they sold at the last exhibition. This is another one where I think the colors and the tonality almost makes the ice look like plastic toys. This one's a close up of a glacier in Argentina. This one's the same glacier in Argentina. At some point I got a little crafty about putting my own background or sky in and cutting the images and collaging different skies in. This is one of my favorite images. I love the simplicity. It was very late in the evening and it was just one iceberg all by itself starting to make its way out to sea. It has a nice sense of quiet to it. This one was also nearby on the same evening. I like the little hint of a purple tone. And then this is the last one from Floating Blue. This also sold in the last exhibition. So I know that one's not in your gallery either. And so Floating Blue is just all icebergs. I felt like my previous exhibition, The End of Nowhere was a little bit disconnected. So I wanted to have a more single pointed vibe. And so I just put all icebergs together. And because that was so long ago, I finished that exhibition in 2017. I'd since been working on a new solo exhibition called Snow, Sand, Ice. So three elements this time, no scapes, sand dunes or landscapes that involve sand and also icebergs. And one of the questions I hear most from people when they find out I photograph icebergs is they say, are you working on the climate crisis? And I hadn't been directly involved in that in any way until recently. So you'll see in a few minutes how that starts to come about. I'll read you the artist statement from Snow, Sand, Ice, and then show you some of the images from it. The day I moved to a desert as a teenager, someone welcoming me to the area said, look how big the sky is. I became intrigued with how landscapes that are void of most vegetation can strikingly portray the illusion of vast spaciousness, as well as allow for direct experience with the raw forms, 
colors, and surfaces that might otherwise be obscured by grass, moss, or trees. For this body of work, I traveled extensively through the treeless Arctic deserts of Iceland, the world's driest desert, Atacama of Northern Chile, the deserts of the American West, and the mouth of the ice fjord in Greenland where the most productive glacier in the Northern hemisphere surrenders to the sea. I've created a series of landscape photographs that offer a glimpse of the most remote corners of the world while also addressing the climate crisis in unique ways, including through a spoken word short film that is set in an imagined future. These natural and sometimes fabricated fantasy-like settings invoke the beauty and drama of fairy tales when long ago giants and elves walk the earth. I like making artist statements that are fairly broad so that I can put just about anything in there that I want to. So a couple of things start to change around 2017. One of them is I upgraded my equipment. So now I'm using top of the line photographic equipment. So the images are much sharper and clearer. I've also changed my mode of travel. So I'm no longer on a bicycle. Uh, when I go to Greenland, I'm usually walking. And when I'm in Iceland, I'm usually driving a car through the highlands. So with this exhibition, the color scheme gets a little bit broader. It could be just about anything here. It's not limited to just the blue tones. And so this is the first image where I started to confront the climate crisis. I got these um, latex dinosaur masks. And I really like the relationship of dinosaurs as being symbolic to extinction. So here this figure, it's me under the mask, <laughs> looking out at the receding glacier. You can see the line here where the glacier has receded and it's exposing the land. And even these mountains coming up out of the glacier wouldn't have been visible a few years ago. They would have been under ice. But um, I wanted to address the climate crisis in a powerful but quiet way or in a subtle way. So here it's the masked dinosaur human bearing witness to the extinction of the ice. This one was actually a really bad photograph that I tried for years to do something good with. <laughs> and um, I couldn't quite get it to sing until I over-processed it and dropped in a sky that didn't belong to me. <laughs> so the original photograph is the ice and the water. And then I used a stock photograph and uh, similar colors in a sky that helped bring it to life in a nice way. I always love the monochrome where it's just one color. This is a really big iceberg. This is about 80 feet high. I take a boat out into the fjord every night so I, I go into the same setting three, four, five, sometimes six nights in a row. So I get the opportunity to photograph the same icebergs over and over. 
under different lighting and atmospheric conditions. But it also depends on which way the boatman goes because I don't drive the boat. So we may or may not take about the same route through. And this is a peculiar configuration. The ice configuration was just as you see it, but again, it was a bad photograph. So I highly processed it and added a sky from a stock photo. I'm gonna back up and read you the process for floating blue because it has a little bit to do with the light and why most of the photographs are blue. I began traveling to what is sometimes called the iceberg capital of the world about 13 years ago. It is the largest ice fjord in the Northern Hemisphere on the west coast of Greenland. Back in the early years when I started, I would be on the tail end of an annual trip that had taken me through Iceland on a bicycle. Though there are no roads connecting towns in Greenland, I'd arrived by plane with a bike and used it to carry my camping gear and get around the little town of Ilulisat. Originally, I used only a tiny pocket camera to shoot the black and whites. The more recent color shots were with a compact camera, not much bigger than a pocket camera. I especially love the quality of soft light during what is called the blue hour. It occurs during the last stages of twilight in the evening when indirect sunlight impose a predominantly blue shade on the ice that is different from the blue shade visible during most of the day. There's also a sharp drop in temperature, sometimes allowing fog to roll in, bringing an eerie feel to the boat ride through the fjord of towering ice. I travel there in very late August or early September when the blue hour is in its prime. This is one of the sand images. Again, I started with a bad image that I couldn't, I couldn't have put out as just a, a straight landscape photograph. The original image is the sand dune and the background mountains and the foreground with the vegetation. And it, it just wasn't an exciting photograph. So I turned it to black and white and put in these elements. I collaged in the dancer, the polar bear, the sky, and the dinosaurs in the sky. And in this image, I really enjoy the visual vantage point of the characters, like the line between the dancer's eye and the dinosaur's eye, and also the way the little polar bear, it's a baby polar bear, I guess, is running out of the scene as if he's trying to escape. This is the ice fjord in a year when there's lots of water in it. Some years it's completely frozen. This particular year it just had a lot of liquid in it. Obviously highly processed photograph here. Usually when my photographs are highly processed, it's because it didn't work otherwise. So it's like a last alternative <laughs> that I use a lot of effects. And it doesn't always work. In fact, it only rarely works. But here, I think it worked pretty well. Another highly processed. <laughs> I loved the ice image, but it was very long and had nothing else going on. 
So I created what looks like a reflection down here. It's actually fake. I just flipped the image. And then this is a sky from a different image, which is highly processed, but it also looked nice just by itself. I like the tonalities. I like how the background looks like an oil painting. So this one's just a little bit of ice with a lot of sky. Here I am with a dinosaur mask again. I questioned a little bit if snow was under extinction and if sand was affected by climate change. And as I researched these things, I found out that everything, all earth forms are threatened. This is a very unusual lighting effect on ice. Believe it or not, this one is not highly processed. It's just a little bit. It was just that late evening sun when the light is hitting the white ice, so causing it this gold look and um, this cathedral-like lighting back in this area. And there's one more. Again, it started as a bad image. The iceberg itself was is a wonderful shape, but it had some contrast problems with it. So it just didn't come to life by itself. So I put this sky overlay to try to create some kind of effect and then try to really play up these areas where the light is hitting the ice and the water. And then I also like the image, the idea of um, evaporation, like as if the ice is now sky, which is what icebergs ultimately turn into. Let me check my notes here. Maybe I'll finish the iceberg section with a little story from the end of nowhere. So this one's about a two minute read. There are no roads connecting towns in Greenland. I missed the last helicopter of the day and was lucky to hitch a ride on a speedboat with a local family. The engine roars as we go way too fast through iceberg clogged waters along the coastline. The driver is a real daredevil. Every few minutes we sideswipe a small iceberg or get trapped in iceberg gridlock and need to back out. When it gets quiet, when it gets quiet after an engine stall, he asks where I'm from. When I tell him, one of the children smiles and says, Empire State Building, and hands me an M&M. In a split second, the driver kills the engine, yells, then points, and we see two seals in the water. A frantic, a frantic scuffle ensues, 